Hello, I'm Graham Priest again, and this is the fourth of a series of short lectures we're doing on the relationship between Buddhism and science. Now, um, as I mentioned in the last lecture, Buddhism made a break from uh, the Vedic Hinduism that was uh, extant at the time of the break, about the 5th or 6th century BCE, and it broke in two important ways. First of all, Hinduism is theistic, there's a godhead, and Buddhism is atheistic. Now, that's what I addressed in the last lecture, and I explained that uh, this break has consequences for the relationship between Buddhism and science. That's one break. Now, the second major break was that Hinduism has a concept of the self, an Atman. Indeed, one of the major planks of Hinduism is that in some sense, and not very clear sense, Brahman is Atman, God is self. We're not going to go into that though, because we're talking about Buddhism, and Buddhism rejects the existence of a self. And I'm going to talk about the nature of this view today, and its relationship of that to the modern conception of what it means to be a person the scientific conception of what it means to be a person. Now, um, Buddhism denies the existence of a self. The notion of self at issue is this. The self is a part of you which remains constant all the time that you exist and defines you as you. So it's, the, it's your sort of essential core, if you like. It's the uh, essence which constitutes you. It's uh, constant, it's the same thing all the time you exist, and it wants, makes you, you. Now, this is exactly the kind of uh, self, Atman, that the Hindus had in mind, and that was what the Buddhists were attacking. But if you think of it for a moment, you'll see that this notion of self is actually quite common in many philosophers. So, in Christianity, for example, it's traditionally held that people have a soul, and this is exactly a self in the sense that the Buddhists were taking issue with. Uh, your soul is something that is essentially you, it exists all the time that you do, and in fact it's the, it's the core of you, as it were. So what Buddhism is doing is denying that people have a self in this sense. Okay, so you might want to say, well, uh, if people don't have a self, what, what is the understanding of a person that comes out of Buddhism? And the answer is fairly simple, and it's often given by way of an analogy. Um, the analogical object is a chariot, but let me update this and let me make it your car or your motorbike or something like this. Um, what is your motorbike or your car? Well, let's see. Uh, it's made of parts. The parts were assembled in a factory at some stage, they were put together, um, and uh, then the parts interact with each other, they interact with some other elements like the road, sometimes they wear out and they get replaced, and you know eventually the car goes the way of all cars and all the parts fall apart and that's the end of the car. Okay, the car does not have a self, right? there's no part of the car which must remain constant and fixed during the life of the very same car. So even the number plate, for example, can change and it can be the same car. So if you live in one state in Australia and you move to another state, you change your number plates, but it's the same car. So there's, there's nothing about the car that must remain the same. Uh, it's just a bunch of parts which come into existence when conditions or causes are ripe, interact, wear out, get replaced, and then uh, finally all fall apart and the car goes out of existence. Well, the Buddhist view of the self, of, of the Buddhist view of persons, is that you are like that. You are composed of a bunch of parts. These came into existence when cause the conditions were ripe. They interact with each other and the environment. Uh, sometimes they get replaced. I mean, the molecules of your body change every morning to a certain extent after breakfast. And in the end, they fall apart and you die. So you're like the car. So just as the car or the motorbike has no self, in the sense that I explained, neither does a person. All right, so that's the Buddhist view. Uh, and of course, you can ask, well, you know, why should I believe 
that people have no self. I, all I've done so far is explain the view. I haven't tried to justify it. So um, how does one go about arguing that one has no self? Well, the most obvious thing is, is this. Um, what does modern science tell us about a person? Okay, if you look at what modern science tells us about a person, then uh, a person is a, a collection of um, biopsychological parts uh, which come into existence at a certain time um, in the uterus, um, which evolve as a person grows up and then fall apart. So, mo what, what modern science tells us about a person is essentially what Buddhism tells about a person. Um, you will never find a scientist or a biologist or an anatomist looking for the self or a soul. It just does no scientific work. Of course, the parts in question that a modern anatomist or physiologist uses aren't exactly the parts that the um, Buddhists had in mind. They had a very sophisticated theory of parts. Uh, however, you know, science has gone a long way since that time. Uh, but the basic idea that a person is a partite object in a state of flux with no essential self is essentially the modern scientific view. Okay, but how did the Buddhists justify the view? I mean, obviously they couldn't appeal to the findings of modern science. So let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the arguments. Now, the first argument they used is very, very similar to an argument that was put forward by the Scottish philosopher David Hume in the um, 18th century who is often held to have a similar view of the nature of persons to Buddhists. Okay, so let me give you a short passage from David Hume where he explains why he doesn't think that a person has a self. So he says this, There are some philosophers who imagine that we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self, that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence and a certain beyond the evidence of any demonstration, both of its perfect identity and its simplicity. The strongest sensation, the most violent passion, say they, instead of distracting us from this view, only fix it the more intensely and make us consider the influence on self either by the pain or the pleasure. Now, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. Now, if anyone upon serious and unprejudiced reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself, then I must confess I can no longer reason with him. All I can allow him is this, that he may be as right as well as I am, and that we are essentially different in this particular. He may perhaps perceive something simple and continued which he calls himself, though I'm certain that there's no such principle in me. But setting aside some metaphysician of this kind, I may venture to affirm of the rest of mankind that they are nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement. So, so here is David Hume saying that he can't find a self. When he looks into his mind or his sensations, he sees different perceptions, but no self, nothing constant which fixes him. All right. Now, Hume inferred from this uh, that there's no self, or at least we had no good reason to believe there's a self. Now, that's a bit fast, because uh, the reason that Hume took this step was that he was an empiricist. He thought that if we had reason to believe that there was a self, it had to be the kind of thing you could experience. Well, maybe that was a reasonable view in the 18th century, but nowadays it's not a good view, because nowadays in modern science, there are many things we believe to exist which we cannot perceive. For example, various subatomic particles, uh, magnetic fields, uh, gluons, uh, what have you. We never experience these things directly. What we do is we make theoretical posits of them because that allows us to explain things we do perceive 
like you know uh, what the television does or uh, um, what the latest uh, computer does or what have you. So Hume's empiricism is not really tenable any longer, but uh, the Buddhists weren't quite empiricists in Hume's sense. They're very clear that if you come to have a good reason to believe that something exists, then there are two kinds of reasons. First is you can experience it. But the second is precisely that it's some kind of theoretical posit. So this is explained, for example, in uh, the Abhinama Kosha, uh, a text by Vasubandhu, 4th century. I mentioned him briefly in the first lecture. So uh, he would have agreed with Hume that we cannot experience the self, but that doesn't end the matter. Uh, the question then is whether we have good reason to make a theoretical posit of it. So you make a theoretical posit of something when you have, when it performs some explanatory function. Okay, it does something, it buys you something. So the question then becomes, well, uh, what reasons are there to posit a self? What is it that this theoretical posit buys you that you cannot otherwise explain? Okay, that's the question. Well, conceivably, I suppose, there could be a number of things that positing the self is supposed to explain. But the most obvious thing is this. Okay, there are all kinds of kind of perceptions and sensations and emotions going on, but some of them hang together. Okay, some of them seem to be mine, whereas some of them seem to be yours, and yours don't hang together with mine in that sense. So here's what the self does. It's what binds a number of these perceptions or sensations together in a unity. Uh, it accounts for, as uh, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant said, uh, the synthetic unity of our perception, which is a long mouthful, meaning it just makes the stuff hang together, right? So um, does the self do that? Well, are there other explanations of that? And indeed, there are. And in fact, they were given by Vasubandhu himself. Let me update it a bit, since physiology has moved on a little bit. But let me explain what essentially is Vasubandhu's answer. Now, um, the way things hang together can be synchronic at the same time, or diachronic at different times. So let's take those two separately. Synchronic. So I'm walking down the road, uh, a motorbike goes past. I see it and I hear it, okay? Um, and although those are different sensory modalities, they're part of a unified experience of the motorbike for me. Okay, my perception of the sound and the sight hang together. Now, by contrast, uh, you and I are walking down the street. I'm not looking, but I hear it. Uh, and you're listening to music, so you don't hear it, but you see it. Now, your visual perception and my auditory perception don't hang together in the same way as my auditory perception and my visual perception. Okay, so that's the kind of way that sensations can hang together. They're mine. Now, what's the explanation for that? Well, you know, modern science has a perfectly good explanation, and it's a causal one. So when I see uh, the motorbike or whatever, it registers in my, visitory, uh, my, my visual cortex. The sound registers in my auditory cortex, and these two parts of the brain interact with each other to produce uh, a multisensory unified uh, experience. Okay, that's what explains the unity of my experience. It's the fact that the different parts of the brain are relating to each other in a certain way. Now, obviously, if you hear the motorbike and I see it, there's no similar causal connection within my brain or anybody else's. So it's the causal functioning of the brain, the causal networks in the brain, which produce the unity of experience. You don't have to invoke a self to explain this. It's explained by perfectly normal causal procedures. That's synchronic. Okay. What about diachronic? So this is um, things over time. This can be both backwards and forwards. So let's, let's think about an example of each. Backwards. Um, yesterday, I saw the motorbike. Today, when I think about it, I can remember it. Okay? Uh, and yesterday's perception of the motorbike and my memories hang together 
in a way that, say, your perception of the motorbike yesterday and my memories don't hang together. All right. Now, why do my memories and the past perception hang together? Well, again, it's a perfectly causal explanation. So when I am aware of the motorbike yesterday, this information is recorded in the part of the brain which is concerned with memory, the limbic system, and then that can be stimulated in order to produce the memory. So again, perfectly causal processes. And again, uh, no similar causal processes exist between, say, your perception of the motorbike yesterday and my memories today. There's just not a similar kind of causal connection. So that's diachronic and that's in the past. Now, what about diachronic in the future? Actions have consequences. Okay, so I go to the pub tonight and I have a desire to drink and then I have another desire to drink and, you know, my desire calls me to drink, well, perhaps too much and tomorrow morning I wake up with a hangover. Okay, so uh, my desire today is connected with my hangover, the headache or whatever tomorrow morning, okay? The desire and the hangover go together as part of me um, in a way that your desire to have a drink tonight cannot possibly be connected with any hangover that I have tomorrow. But again, and now the point's pretty obvious. Um, this, the fact that my desire to drink and my hangover hang together has a perfectly good causal explanation. Uh, so I desire to drink, so I drink, uh, I get mild alcohol poisoning, which gives me the headache tomorrow, and so I experience the headache. Okay, perfectly causal explanation. And so, in virtue of that, it makes sense for me not to drink too much tonight if I don't want to get a headache, because these things hang together by perfectly causal process. It does not make any sense for me in a similar way to prevent you drinking tonight so that I don't get a headache. That's crazy, okay? So, but the bottom line is this, yes, um, sensations, experiences of a particular person do hang together, but you do not need to posit a self or a soul to explain this because um, there's a perfectly good causal explanation of how various experiences hang together. And I've given you sort of the rough outline of how modern science would tackle it. So let me just summarize the main points of this talk. What we've been talking about is the second major way in which Buddhism breaks with Hinduism. It rejects the notion of a self, that is, uh, of a part of you, which is constant through the time that you exist and identifies you as you. Uh, and it denies the existence of such a self. Uh, a person is a bit like a car. It has parts which come together, change, evolve a bit, and finally fall apart. And that's pretty much what modern science tells us that a person is like. Uh, the parts are not quite the same kind that the Buddhists had in mind. They're kind of physi physiological, biological, psychological. But they're, the, the, a person is partite anyway. All right. And then finally, we looked at um, why you might suppose there is no self of the kind at issue. And we noted with Hume that you can't really perceive a self. Um, but that doesn't end the matter because there might be good reasons for inferring it. And then we looked at the most obvious reason why you might posit a self because it explains the way that, for example, my perceptions and sensations hang together in a way that your sensations and my sensations don't hang together. And we saw there's a perfectly good explanation of this in terms of the causal processes investigated by modern science. So in the last lecture, I explained why uh, the atheism of Buddhism makes it uh, much more friendly to the scientific worldview than a theist view. And today I've talked about uh, not atheism, but an Atman, no self, okay? So the Buddhists think that there is uh, no self and uh, that view, again, is consonant with what sort of thing modern science tells us that a person is. So this is a second way in which Buddhist philosophy is much more uh, on rapport with a scientific worldview than traditional theist uh, views and views which posit the existence of a soul or a self like Hinduism or Christianity.